Welcome to Approximation Algorithms and the lecture on randomized rounding of semi-definite programs. My name is Rasmus Pei. Today we are going to talk about convex optimization and how to use it for approximation algorithms. In particular, we're going to talk about semi-definite programming and how it's formulated as vector programming. We're going to look at two case studies, first max cut, and we are also going to look at how to do that in Python, and we're going to look at correlation clustering. Linear programming, which we have used in the last few lectures, considers a collection of constraints that are all half-space constraints. So each constraint basically says that a feasible solution cannot uh, be in a certain half-space. And we have a linear objective function, which tells us the direction, so to speak, of the optimum. It is easy to see that if we look at this line segment between any feasible solution and the optimum solution, all those solutions are also going to be feasible. There's a much broader class of optimization problems that can be solved efficiently, as long as the, object, the half constraints are convex, like in the case of linear programming. So in general, if we think about a collection of convex constraints, so they do not have to be linear, it's just that the set of points uh, satisfying each constraint must be conv convex, and we need to satisfy all of these constraints, we are also going to have a convex feasible region. And if we have a linear objective function, then we have a property similar to the case of linear programming, where from any feasible solution, we can walk in a straight line basically to an optimal solution. So linear programming is polynomial time solvable and also efficiently solvable in practice. For general convex optimization problem, the picture is a bit more complex, but one could say that usually they are efficiently solvable, at least up to some additive error. So in the following, we're simply going to assume that we have a black box that can solve such problems. A particular kind of convex optimization is semi-definite programming, which we're going to define in the following. In semi-definite programming, decision variables form a symmetric matrix X that can also be written as a product of a matrix V transpose multiplied by a matrix, the same matrix V. Here V is an n by n real matrix. The column vectors of V will denote by V1 through Vn. And this means that a particular entry Xij in X is the dot product of the vector Vi with the vector Vj. And remember that a dot product is simply the sum of products of vector entries. The requirement that x equals v transpose v for some matrix v is often written x greater than zero. We sometimes say that x is positive semi-definite. Apart from the very different decision variables, a semi-definite program looks very much like a linear program. We have a linear objective function where we want to maximize a linear combination of all the decision variables. We also have linear constraints of the form that a linear combination of the decision variables must equal a particular value bk. So we have a collection of such constraints. And finally, as mentioned above, we need to constrain x to be positive semi-definite and symmetric. Often semi-definite programs are presented in a different form, also called vector programming. So here we use the entries of V uh, directly as decision variables. So that is, we replace Xij by the dot product of Vi and Vj, both in the objective function and in all the linear constraints. So that's the so-called vector programming form. As hinted at before, 
we can solve semi-definite programs at least approximately up to some small error in polynomial time. So we can use it as a black box for efficient algorithms. Our first case study for semi-definite programming is the max cut problem. The input is a complete graph where each edge has a weight wij, and the goal is to find a cut, a division into the vertices into a set s and a complement of s that maximizes the sum of the weights of edges crossing the cut, that is, the sum over all i and s and j in v minus s of vij. Now it's time to pause and think. How can MaxCut, as we just defined, be formulated using vector programming, where we can require that the vectors have integer coefficients? Let us look at the vector programming formulation of the MaxCut objective. Suppose we have vectors vi such that vi dot vj is equal to 1 if i and j are on the same side of the cut and 0 otherwise. Then we can write the objective function as the sum over ij of wij times 1 minus vi dot vj. Here we count vij if and only if i and j are on different sides of the cut. And this is for all i less than j. What is the requirement on vi? Well, we can uh, fulfill it by making sure that all vectors vi has plus or minus 1 in the first coordinate and zeros everywhere else. So here the sign of the first coordinate indicates whether or not the vector is an s, and the rest are just there as padding in order to get to n dimensions, which is required for semi-definite programming. Now, semi-definite programming doesn't allow us to restrict the coordinates to be integers. So we need to consider the relaxed version, where instead of requiring vi to have the particular form written here, we relax it to requiring vi to have unit vectors. That is, the dot product of vi with itself must be 1 for all i. Or in other words, the length of all the vectors. vi must be 1. So the remaining question is, how do we go from these vectors, which are now general unit vectors in an n-dimensional space, to values in plus minus 1? We're going to look at this on the next slide. How do you round vectors in n dimensions to either plus 1 or minus 1? There are a couple of extreme cases that are instructive to consider. The first case is if v1 and v2 are almost the same vector. That is, the dot product is very close to 1, which is the maximum possible for unit vectors. This means that the contribution to the max cut is very close to 0. In this case, we want vertex 1 and 2 on the same side of the cut. So either both of them should be plus 1 or minus 1. The other extreme is where the two vectors are in opposite directions. So the dot product is close to minus 1, which is the smallest possible for unit vectors. In this case, the contribution to the objective function is close to the, uh, to the maximum possible of 2 times w12. We want these two vertices to be on different sides of the cut. And then, of course, in between, the middle case, if you like, is the situation where v1 and v2 are close to orthogonal. So the dot product is close to zero. In this case, the contribution to the objective function is going to be half of, of the maximum possible, so around w12. And in this case, it doesn't really matter. So we are happy if vertex 1 and 2 lands on different sides with probability 1 half. So this is the intuition. To implement this or turn this into an actual rounding algorithm, we use a method now known as locality-sensitive hashing. In fact, this was invented exactly for the purpose of approximating max cut. So based on the intuition we had before, what we want 
is that the probability that the hash values of v1 and v2 is uh, equal to each other is zero if they have a dot product of minus one. It must be one if they have a dot product of one and about one half if they have a dot product of zero. And again, here we assume for simplicity that we have unit vectors. It turns out it doesn't really matter that much. Okay. So the idea of the construction is to sample a random hyperplane. So a n minus one dimensional plane that passes through the origin. Um, and such a hyperplane can be described by a normal vector r that is orthogonal to all the points in the hyperplane. And then we simply map one side of the hyperplane to minus one and the other side to plus one. So if v1 and v2 are almost in the same direction, then almost always the hyperplane is not going to split to divide them on different sides, but then they are almost always going to end up either on the positive or the negative side. Whereas if they are uh, in opposite directions, or almost in opposite directions, we are almost always going to get them on different sides of the hyperplane. Uh, in terms of the normal vector, this means that the dot product um, of, the, of the two vectors with, with R, the normal vector, is going to have uh, a, a sign that can be used to say whether we are on one side or the other. Okay. And notice here that the sign is indeed in independent of the length of the normal vector r. And the fact is that if we take r to be an n-dimensional normal distributed vector, it, it works. It gives us the normal vector of, of a random hyperplane. To analyze the approximation factor, it's instructive to look at the effect of the rounding. So here's the definition of the, of the locality sensitive hash function, also known as simhash. And we can plot the probability of hashing to the same value as a function of the dot product between two input vectors. So, so these are the three points that we wanted. So we wanted zero collision probability if the dot product was minus one half at zero and one at one. So we could hope for the dotted line here. Unfortunately, that doesn't work, but what we can get is this green line. Um, look, look, please look at the book for, for details. So we have something that is pretty close to this ideal line and is actually, efficient, is actually possible and you implement it exactly as described in the, in the previous slide. To analyze the approximation factor, we need to compare the value of the objective function output by the semi-definite programming relax to the rounded value output by the locality sensitive hashing, which can be written uh, like this. And well, basically you have to look at this particular curve for the expected value. And it turns out that it can be lower bounded by 0 0.878 times the objective value of the relaxed. And since the relaxed version is at least as good as the integer version, we have our approximation algorithm. Let's look at how this can be implemented in, in Python. So again, we are going to use the, the library that we used for linear programming. But here we are going to use only the data file uh, class. The way this is implemented is a little bit more low level. You have to work directly with matrices. Um, and in order to do this, we need a way of mapping between uh, names of vertices in the graph and indexes in this matrix. So we are going to have two maps, one that maps a vertex ID, a string, to an index, and one that maps an index back to a vertex ID. So this check vertex class here just uh, registers new uh, vertices and new indices like, like that. And we also have a, a class, a graph weight matrix, that takes a graph as input and is able to insert all the edges of the graph into uh, these two maps and output a vector, sorry, output a, a matrix W uh, 
that is, is all zero except for indices that correspond to an edge. And for those indices, it contains a one. And in this matrix, either for each pair u, v, either u, v is, is one or v, u is one, but not, not both of them. Okay. So let's look how look at how this is used to solve max cut as we went through before. Um, so we're going to solve the unweighted case on the on the graphs that we also looked at for um, LP based uh, randomized rounding. So and we're going to use CVX Pi, which is a library for convex optimization in Python. We are also going to use uh, something called Jaleski decomposition from from SciPy from the SciPy library. So we have a loop that loops over all the all the graphs, and for each graph, we read in the data and construct the weight matrix W. Um, and n here is is the dimension of this matrix. So to solve the uh, semi-definite program, we define the decision variable x as a, an n by n symmetric matrix, and we define a constraint here that says that x has to be positive definite. Also, we add the constraints from the from the formulation that we saw just before that x i comma i, so that is the dot product of v i with itself must be one for for every i. So the, these are the constraints, and um, in order to uh, define the problem, we call the, the the constructor here, which takes two arguments. So the first argument here is the is the objective function. And it's, it looks um, very much like what we saw in the lecture, except for this uh, mysterious last part here. So let me just uh, explain what goes on here. So we have uh, the weight matrix, and we have a matrix that is the all ones matrix minus uh, x, the solution. And the operator we have here is the so-called Hadamard product, which takes uh, constructs a, a huge n squared by n squared matrix that contains all possible uh, products of an entry of w and an entry of uh, ones minus x. So this, this huge matrix contains everything we need to um, add up to, for, uh, to formulate the constraint, or the uh, objective function, sorry, um, in order to get out the right parts. So we want the weight ij to be multiplied by the by one minus xij, we apply the trace operator. So the trace operator does exactly that. So it it picks out and and sums exactly the the entries where uh, uh, along the diagonal of, of this large Hadamard matrix, which is exactly those where the index of uh, w matches the the index of, of x. Okay. So this is just a reformulation of the objective function. And then the second argument is just the, the list of constraints. We call, can call solve to, to solve it. And now um, we can read off the, the, the optimal value as x dot value. And, but in order to, to do the randomized rounding, we actually need the, the v uh, matrix, not, not x. So we need to somehow recover v from, from x. And in order to do that, we can use something called Cholesky decomposition, which exactly takes s x and writes it as a, as a matrix product. Um, so unfortunately, because of uh, numerical issues, uh, this doesn't work, work directly, because x is not exactly positive uh, definite. So in order to, to deal with that, we can add the identity matrix scaled by some small factor. And this is enough to make the, the matrix positive semi-definite uh, without, um, without changing it too much. Okay. So we're going to get a v out of this, which approximately is, is, the, is the square root of x in the sense that v transpose v equals x. Okay. So now we have the solution in the, in the right form, and we're ready to do randomized rounding. And in order to do this, so we're actually going to do this many times, a thousand times in this example. Um, in order to do this, we use the locality sensitive hash, sensitive hash functions that we saw uh, before. So we sample a, an n-dimensional normally distributed vector r, and we look at the 
dot product of, of r, which with each of the um, column vectors of v. And this gives us and the sign and compute the signs for each of these dot products. And this gives us the, the randomized rounding for each vector in, in v. And we can compute the, the cut here. So the cut are exactly those where the roundings or the cut edges are exactly those where the rounding of, of u and v are, are different. So one rounds to minus one and one rounds to one. And we can yeah, record the size of this cut. This is just the length of this, this list of cut edges. And um, we report over these uh, thousand repetitions, we've, we've report the, the best, the maximum cut weight found and also the, the worst one, just for, for reference. Okay. So this is apply, applied to all the, all the graphs from before. And you can see here that uh, we get the solution to the relaxed version here is, is pretty close actually to the best cut that is found. So the, so the rounding works really well and finds, is able to find a cut that has, has almost as good as a, a, a value as the relaxation. And in fact, because we know that the, the optimal solution is integer, we, we can see that, um, that the optimum must, must be 13. Okay. Um, in some cases, there is a gap. So for example, if we go down, down here to the Karate Club, so the, the upper bound from the relaxation is uh, 63.48. So we know that it's not possible to find, find a, a cut that's larger than that. So this means again that 63 is the best we could, we could hope for. And the randomized rounding find, finds a cut of, uh, of weight 61, so which is very, very close to the best we could imagine. Um, it is important to, to do this a number of times. So we can be unlucky and find, um, find roundings that are considerably worse than, than uh, what we would get in expectation. Uh, yeah, and that's pretty much it. In the final part of the lecture, we're going to look at a correlation clustering problem. The input consists of two matrices. So W plus and W minus. And the entries are subscripted with I and J. Both are n by n matrices. And so think about these as two different way, weightings on complete graphs. And the output is must be a mapping into clusters. So each vertex V is mapped to a cluster C of V for each uh, index up to between 1 and n. And the objective is to maximize the sum of Wi j plus over all things in the same cluster plus the sum of wij minus over all things that are in different clusters. So think about all the indices as points. In this case, we have five different, we have split them into five different clusters. For, so for every pair of points or vertices in the same cluster, we gain wij plus. And for every pair of vertices in different clusters, we gain um, wij minus. Okay, so now I would like you to pause and think. How can we express or formulate correlation clustering as a vector programming problem? And a hint here is that we want the decision variables, the vi and vjs, to satisfy that the dot product is one, if and only if i and j are in the same cluster and zero otherwise. Let's look at a vector programming formulation of the correlation clustering problem. So the objective from before is, is like this, and we want to express the decision variables as dot products such that vi comma vj is is one for those pairs in the same cluster and zero otherwise and this means that our objective function should look like this now we have a one here which is kind of different from the form that we said that um, vector programming could have, but this is just basically a constant that is the same, so it doesn't change the, the optimal. And now one way of achieving this is to require that each vi is, is a basis vector, standard basis vector. 
Um, of course, we cannot really know if we get standard basis vectors out of uh, a solution to um, semi-definite program. So, but we, what we can require is that we get unit vectors out. And furthermore, we can require that we get um, non-negative dot products. So all the dot products must be at least zero. So this is the relaxed semi-definite programming formulation. And the next step, of course, is that we need to map these, these unit vectors back into, into clusters. So for each vector v, we need a cluster C of e. And um, ideally, what we would like to, to do is to kind of mimic the, the objective function and get that the probability of mapping to the same cluster would be exactly the dot product of vi and vj. And of course, this means that the probability of mapping to different clusters would be one minus that, and that would give us exactly the, the right expected value. Um, unfortunately, as we saw before, um, it's not really possible to, to, to achieve this, but we can get, get pretty close with this uh, sim hash, locality sensitive hash function. So indeed, this is what we are, we are going to do. So the actual random clustering that we, we do uh, uses not, not one, but uh, two of the sim hash, func hash functions, so h1 and h2 chosen independently. Um, and we define the, uh, the cluster of a vertex v as the concatenation of the sim hash value. So we get a vector of length 2 with entries in minus 1 plus 1, so four, four distinct clusters. And now we can, we know the collision probability of uh, SimHash and its relationship to the dot product. So we can show that uh, we can bound the expected value of, um, of the objective function by three thirds times the value of the relaxed version, which again upper bounds opt.